Eric just mentioned. Uh, I, I'm, the, I'm the author and uh, presenter of the Ruby on Rails tutorial book and the Rails tutorial screencast. And uh, I'm here to tell you the story. I'm here to tell you the story uh, of, uh, of the Rails tutorial project. Uh, just to, I just want to get a quick survey. How many people here have read the Rails tutorial book or have know about it? Okay, so we, okay, quite a lot of people. That's great. So just a little bit of uh, my own background, just to, to set the stage for, for the Rails tutorial project. Uh, I have a background in theoretical physics, and uh, I did physics research in, in graduate school at Caltech, where I also uh, taught classes in the physics core curriculum. Uh, but while I was in grad school, I, I got uh, bitten by uh, the uh, entrepreneur bug. And uh, so after I graduated, I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go a, a different way. I'm not going to become an academic. And one of the uh, influences for me was a series of essays, including this one called How to Start a Startup, uh, by a man named Paul Graham. And interestingly, Paul has a similar sort of background. He has a PhD in computer science from Harvard and uh, decided not to become an academic. Decided not to become an academic. Uh, and one of the things he discovered after he graduated is cutting in and out, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, one of the things uh, that he discovered after he graduated is that he, he was doing list consulting. Um, which, as he says, it, it was uh, it was like treading water. It was easy, but he knew he would drown if he stopped. And so he decided that he wanted to solve his money problem by starting a startup. And so I thought, that, that seems like a good idea. What, what happened uh, with, with Paul's company is uh, he ended up selling it to Yahoo for a large amount of money, and he did solve his money problem. So I thought, well, maybe I can solve my money problem, and I'll start a startup too. Uh, the startup I started with uh, one of my Caltech friends it was, a, it was a fantasy sports startup, of all things. Um, it was pretty cool, uh, and for a variety of reasons, it, it didn't quite work out, including some things beyond our control. Um, and so, so I was left with a, another kind of money problem, which is I didn't really have a whole lot of money. After doing a startup, you watch your state. I mean, I was in grad school before that, too, so you can do the math on you know, how much money I had floating around. Uh, so so after, after my first startup shut down, uh, one of my friends from Caltech was approached about writing a book on Rails, and I thought, well, that's a good thing to do. And maybe if I write a book, uh, that will help help me in my my, uh, my technical career. And and so uh, we wrote uh, this book together called Rails Space. I'd like to apologize for the title. This is my fault. Uh, the the title is Rails Space: Building a Social Networking Website with Ruby on Rails. And so people thought it was about social networking, uh, building a social networking website, but it really was just a Rails tutorial book that happened to use a uh, social networking uh, website as, as its example application. Now, the publisher wanted to call this book Ruby on Rails Tutorial, which I thought, this is such a boring, stupid name for a book. Why would you want to call it something so lame? So I talked in, in, in Rails space. <laughs> so that's my fault. <laughs> but I, I, somehow, I think I, I'll, I'm going to atone for that mistake. <laughs> And actually, Rails did really well. We, uh, it was very well received, and I think for a time, for, for, for maybe the first six months, it was really like, the best Rails tutorial out there. Uh, but but then then something happened. The rest revolution hit. When we started Rails Space, uh, it was uh, I think Rails was like 1.1. And uh, those of you who do a lot of Rails application development know, especially if you've been doing it for a while, know that there was a big shift in the way uh, Rails applications are structured. And so we did have some rest structured uh, application code in the book, but most of the book was not was not restful, as they say. And so it went out of date pretty fast. And even though it did pretty well for a technical book, even, even a technical book isn't going to solve your money problem. And the next thing I did was uh, to, to do another startup, but it takes me a while to learn things, I guess. I, I applied and was accepted to a program called Y Combinator, which, among other things, was uh, started by Paul Graham, who I mentioned uh, previously, uh, along with several of, of, uh, of his colleagues. And I, I'm not going to go into details. This is a blank slide by design. I applied with one idea with my co-founder, and I had one idea, and then we switched to another idea, and we tried another idea. And sometimes people say, "Oh, you know, we're really interested in, in hearing. We're, we're interested in hearing what the uh, what the ideas were, like the process." And, and if you, if you say to me, you're interested in hearing about that, I believe you. I just don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it was painful. It was unpleasant at times. Um, but, but, but there will 
there is something about the Y Combinator program you should know, which is that at the end of, of this, this entrepreneur program, you, you give a pitch. You give a, you give a pitch. Try not to get the mic. You give you give a pitch to a large number of investors, including a lot of the, the biggest shots in Silicon Valley. And, and so Paul is always telling you, you must fear demo day. You must fear demo day. It's, it's like it's like a shark coming to get you, or possibly a hippo, something big and dangerous. And, and so, so Paul said, "Wait a minute. What was your book about again? Something about uh, social networks? Well, do do that. Make a social networking platform. So, so that's how Insoshi was born. Uh, it was sort of born out of desperation to have something to say uh, on Demo Day. Uh, and actually, Insoshi did pretty well uh, in the sense that it got quite a bit of adoption. It was for the, the time one of the top, most popular fork repositories on GitHub." Uh, it, it wasn't really a business by itself, but we actually did attract some investor interest and, and like a jumping off, and using Insoji as a jumping off point. And we were actually on the brink of raising a substantial amount of money um, at the in, around October of 2008, depicted here. <laughs> Do you remember what the markets were doing in October of 2008? It turns out that was a bad time to be on the brink of raising a lot of money. And so our, our potential investors kind of gave us the runaround for a while, and, and they said, uh, finally, they said, we'll be happy to fund you if you can show us a mature product with lots of traction. And so for those of you who don't know, this is how they say no in Silicon Valley. <laughs> it's a polite no, and I bear the potential investors know it will. Um, but unfortunately, it, it left me with the same situation I had, which is I've got, I've got the wrong kind of money problem. Um, I want to solve this money problem, and, and it's not working out. So, so I started to think about this. and. and I decided to analyze this sort of from first principles. Um, there's this balance between risk and reward. And sort of at the low end, you've got, you've got a job, which is it's actually, I have, a, I have a very positive view on jobs, and sort of the entrepreneur community, people are always, uh, they're always saying bad things about jobs. But jobs are a good thing, they solve an important problem. But they're low risk, low reward. Um, and up here is, is, a, is where a startup is, it's a really high risk, really high reward, potential, really high potential reward. And so if, if things work out well for you, um, you could end up like uh, one of the other companies in the same Y Combinator round that I was in, uh, Heroku. Um, you, you might end up like this. <laughs> I, I haven't actually been to the new uh, uh, Heroku headquarters in San Francisco, but I, I, I've been told that this is pretty much what it looks like. <laughs> the, the problem is that more likely if you start a startup, you'll end up with what, what my, my situation. And so I started to reflect on this risk-reward spectrum, and I thought, you know, I think there are a lot of good reasons to start a startup, but solving your money problem isn't really one of them. I mean, it might work out for you, but the chances are that you'll be left with uh, with very little. And so I thought, maybe maybe there's like a sweet spot in between. Maybe there's sort of a medium risk, medium reward um, kind of situation. You know, you want to end up um, like a like a pirate sitting on a bunch of gold balloons. But you also won't end up with this. I thought maybe I can do something in, in between. Like this would solve my money problem. I don't really need to be super rich. Just something, something more than this like very small amount. And so I, I did reflect at this point though on on one of the core principles of startups, which is to make something people want. This is incredibly difficult, and it, it's uh, it is in fact the Y Combinator motto. And you might be able to see this on the shirt. Make something people want. This is a shirt that you get when you join the program. It's really, really hard to make something people want. Don't underestimate how hard that is. But I looked at this and said, you know what? I have made something people wanted. Rails based did pretty well. Maybe I can write another Rails tutorial book and, and turn Rails based into this. But maybe I can write another book. And, and in fact, I thought, this isn't, isn't going to be enough in, because it's a technical book. It's not going to be enough to solve my money problem. But I, I used uh, my knowledge of, of the, the market for Rails educational products, which I've been consuming myself and, and had contributed to, uh, to, 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 to see this, this gap in the marketplace, which I believed that there was a need for a long, comprehensive introduction to Rails, uh, a, a series of screencasts, much more comprehensive than had been made before. Uh, this was based partially on my intuition from having taught the core curriculum in, the, in, in, uh, in physics at Caltech. I felt like Becoming a basically competent Rails developer was about the size of a, like a one-term course at Caltech, like Physics 1A, which is about 20 hours of instruction. So I thought maybe a 10 to 20 hours of instruction, which was much longer than anything else out there. I also knew Rails 3 was coming out, so I thought 
that, that there might be some good timing. And so, so this is uh, one of the first marketing principles that, that I learned as, as, a, as a geek sort of coming to, uh, to marketing educational products, which is to address a market you understand. I, I, this is so important, I think, to address a market that you, where you really know what's going on. And I also think that sort of implicit in this is, is this idea that you should do something you're good at. In other words, you should understand the market and you should be able to address that market and do it well. And so I knew that I could write a good book because I'd done it before uh, with Railspace. And I also knew that uh, I could make screencasts, even though I hadn't done a lot of screencasting. Uh, it's essentially just teaching and I had a lot of success in the classroom at Caltech. So I, I figured that I could, that I could do this. Um, There's one uh, another principle that, uh, that I adopted really early on and uh, it was later driven home to me by uh, a certain um, Sith Lord, who's actually in the audience right now. <laughs> uh, so so th this is a common thing in information product marketing, but Giles Boquette would, really drove this home for me, which is you should give something away. This is an incredibly powerful marketing tool. And so even from the start, I thought, I want my book to be available for free as HTML. So I had a vision for what this could be, something approximately like, approximately like this. Now, I want to emphasize that this is not charity. In fact, I'm, I'm a little jaded about charity, actually, and pointed opinions on charity. This is not charity. This is a business strategy. If you have a free HTML book online, I thought, people will give you inbound links, right? They'll link to you. Especially because it's free, right? You're much more likely to refer people to a free source. And I also thought, the search engines, they can come in and index it. Like, the web is made of text and links. I should make a book that's made of text and links. It's also good karma. If you give away a book, people notice. And even though I'm jaded about charity, it really feels good. The first time you get an email from some guy in India saying, you know, I can't afford to buy your product, but thank you for making the book free online. I just used it to learn Rails. Like, that's going to get to you, no matter who you are. <laughs> but as, as great as it is to give away a free book online, but as let it be noted, it's not going to solve your money problem. <laughs> it's not a viable business model. Uh, but so I, I had a plan. I had a vision for what this could be. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an HTML book and I'm going to put it online for free. But then I'm going to make a PDF of the same book. And I'm going to make some screencasts. And I'm going to sell those. That was the plan. And so I just wanted, I want, want to know that there's a big surprise here. You may have already thought about this. Wait a minute, you're going to sell a PDF of a book that's available for free online? This is one of the biggest surprises of this whole thing. People will buy, people will buy a PDF. It's unbelievable. I'll we'll talk a little bit more about this later. <laughs> and so in order to, to realize this vision, I, I needed, actually needed some tools. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my whole chain of technology. Here. So um, I, I wanted to, to implement this dual publishing model, this idea that I could um, start with a single source file and convert it to an HTML book and also convert it to PDF. I wanted to be able to make two books from the same source. And so to this, to this end, I, I, I sort of looked around and looked at all the different options. And there were some things that met some of my needs, but uh, nothing that really met all of the, the requirements. And so I rolled up my sleeves and I wrote my own system called Flytechnic. And so um, some of you might be able to guess from the tech here that Polytechnic is ultimately based on Donald Knuth's tech type setting engine. In particular, it's, uh, it, it starts with LaTeX, which is a series of macros written on top of tech for making documents like articles and books. And it converts a select subset of HTML, or of LaTeX to HTML. Now there are some projects, there's a thing called LaTeX to HTML, but it's terrible because it tries to be too general. I just support the subset that I need to make a book. And then there's a little bit of trickery here, but it's pretty, it's really easy if once you have a LaTeX file to make a PDF. There's some late Polytech has some extra stuff to make it a nice PDF. But this this part is easy, but there's a program called PDF, uh, uh, PDF LaTeX. So Polytechnic met my needs for a number of reasons, but one of one of the requirements was that I'd be able to typeset code. And so I just want you to see this is a web page. This is the PDF. They're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close. It's the same source file, so they're in sync by its construction. 
you want to see the, the full result, you can go to realtutorial.org slash book. <coughs> And it's a, it's, a real, it's a real book, I mean, it's a 500 page PDF, and it's all online. Uh, just as, as an aside, and one of the reasons I chose LaTeX is because I wanted to be able to typeset mathematics. And all good math typesetting, uh, or all, all roads to, to good math typesetting lead through tech. Um, and so there is an example of, of one of these documents that I made on the web. Uh, this, is a, this is a web page with nice math typesetting. This is used, uses a math jax to do the, the, the hard rendering. Um, this is a document called the Tau Manifesto. Anyone have any, any tablets? <laughs> right. Converted. All right. So, um, this is an anti pie propaganda piece. You should totally read it at townday.com. Um, really, read it. I mean, you know, I've interviewed at cnn.com, is interviewing me for this on Monday. So it's becoming a thing, so you should check it out. Uh, um, so, as I approach Polytechnic, though, I, 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 I need to tell you a little bit about it. I have a confession to make, which this is hard to say, but I actually suck. I, I really do. I suck. I, I don't know how. I don't. I don't have, have a background in academic like, computer science. I don't know. How, like, this is a markup system. I maybe I need to write a parser. It's like I don't. I don't really know much about this. But I thought this is one of the situations where there's this there's this potential barrier. Oops. I need some activ I need some activation energy like, to get over that potential barrier. And, and instead of like worrying about not being good enough to write a parser, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna plunge forward. And I was inspired by by this code. <laughs> Anyone recognize this horrible language? What is this horrible language? It's not. Pearl. This is Perl. This is Perl. And in fact, this is part of the source code from markdown.pl. Um, markdown is, a, for those of you who don't know, is a nice lightweight um, markup language that can be easily converted to HTML. Um, and if you look at it, if you, if you read Perl, this is, just a, this is just a global regular expression substitution. But in Ruby, we call it a G-sub. And I, I saw this. It was inspiring. I thought, well, I can I mean, I might not be a you know some sort of computer science genius, but I can write a bunch of G subs. <laughs> <laughs> so Polytechnic is, is basically a bunch of G subs. It has a really good test suite though, so it can be refactored. We well, you know once I figured out how to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> and once Judson helps me do it right. So so I, I wrote Polytechnic and it was good enough to write the book. And so I started. And I started by giving something away. But you can't just get something away, you have to do something else. You have to, you have to paint your product. Now, I find self-promotion very unnatural and, and, uh, and awkward, but I've discovered that I can pimp my product. It's a little practice, I've learned how to pimp my product. And so, I, in particular, I got in touch with, uh, with, with an, an awesome guy named Peter Cooper, who launched the first four chapters of my book for me on Rails Inside. So this is uh, the little brother to Ruby Inside, which is the biggest Ruby blog. <coughs> So, so this is how it started. I gave away the first four chapters. And if, if, if you're thinking about ever doing this sort of thing, you may wonder, well, you know, how do I get my thing on Rails inside? Or you know, how do I get other people to pin my product for me? And so it's important to know that, that humans are primates. You may not be aware of this. But humans are primates. And they're more likely to, to do things for people if they have met them or if they have met someone who can give, or, or if, if they get a personal introduction. So it is a really good idea as a computer programmer to get out of your room and go meet people. And I especially recommend going to conferences. So go to conferences. Everyone in this room, you've already followed this rule. It's just great. People who are watching this like record it, you should, you should know that the value of a conference is only partially in the talks. Like a, a lot of the value is just meeting people. Um, one of the other marketing techniques I used was to have lots of launches. Well, there's lots of little launches. So I, I did the first four chapters, right? And then one chapter at a time after that. And every one of the chapter releases was a little event. Um, um, and every time it, would, it, would, it happened, I, I would like, send a, a, a post to my news feed, I would tweet about it, and I would submit it to Hacker News. So this is my Hacker News submission page. Um, I know this is too small to read, so I'll indicate with red arrows um, the submissions that are Rails tutorial related. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, came to your product. Um, so let it be noted that this is, we, we still have a problem. This is, a, this is still not solving my money problem, right? I'm still just giving everything away. And so I want to talk about the e-commerce tool chain that I used. Now, you, if, if you ever want to sell stuff online, you're going to discover that there is, you're, you'll be paralyzed by all your choices, right? This is the activation energy problem. So uh, Amy Hoy has, has a mantra, worry about it when you're rich. Don't agonize over every choice. 
you want to accept payments, right? I know it hurts. He's like, no, I don't want to. Yes. <laughs> you want to use PayPal. <laughs> Worry about it when you're rich. I know you want to use something else, but use PayPal. You need to have some sort of cart, maybe, like coupon codes. You need to handle file downloads. You use, you're going to use eJunkie. This is, I, I decided to use eJunkie. eJunkie, I mean, with a name like eJunkie, can it possibly be good? <laughs> their, I mean, their UI is written in Flash. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it's horrible. But I, no, worry about it when you're rich. <laughs> okay, storage. You're going to store it someplace, it's like something cool and cheap, and I can do better than, no, you can't do a better than handle that way. Maybe you can. Worry about it when you're rich. Just use S3. Okay, so launch time. I'm just going to make these, no decisions, just do the, do the defaults. And, and just get something out there. So, so launch time came for the PDF. This is PDF sales for the Rails 3, Ruby on Rails 3 tutorial. Remember, you have to pick your product. This was the, the main launch on Ruby Inside, Michael Hartle's Rails 3 tutorial book. There's a Ruby on Rails tutorial learn Rails by example link there, by the way. This is, this is a good thing to have. <coughs> Someone linking to your, your site with this. That's good link text. I also got a, a post, Greg Pollock made a post on writing Rails. The main uh, Rails blog. Uh, Rails has great documentation. The first example, RailsTutorial.org. So, how do you how do you arrange this? Do you, how do you launch your thing on Ruby Inside and, and writing Rails? Humans are primates. You cultivate relationships with people. Go to conferences. <laughs> <laughs> so remember our surprise. People will buy a PDF. They will buy a PDF. There was a time when there was no screencast. It was just the online book and the PDF. And people bought the PDF. Like, lots of people bought the PDF. It, it, even after the initial launch event, like, even a couple months out, I was still selling, like, three PDFs a day. Which isn't, you know, vast wealth, but dude, it was a $39 PDF, so, you know, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the amazing thing is, too, that I discovered, that I kept thinking, people are going to, they're going to buy the PDF and then they're going to feel burned because they're going to discover that it's available free online. But, but I was amazed. This is another surprise. They want to pay you. You have no idea how much people want to pay you. So I had got an email from a guy saying, I just uh, I bought your PDF and I just discovered that it was available for free online. Can I get a refund? And I wrote back to him and said, no problem. I just gave you a refund. In fact, I'm surprised that more people haven't asked for refunds because the whole thing is available for free online. And the next day he wrote back and said, I, I have to admit I wasn't completely honest with you. Um, I think your book is great and it's really worth it. I'm just kind of running short of money right now. And so I wrote back to him and said, don't worry about it, dude. I know what it's like to run short of money. Keep the refund and keep the PDF as a gift. It's OK. And I looked at my, at my logs later that day. He went back and rebought the PDF. <laughs> <laughs> Give people an opportunity to pay you. It's amazing. So I had this PDF book, but the, the real flagship product was these screencasts. And so the last part of the tool chain you need to know about is, is what you do for making screencasts. And this is really easy. You should use ScreenFlow. ScreenFlow is awesome. It does everything you could ever want and more. In fact, I use hardly any of the fancy features of ScreenFlow. Um, as you may know, ScreenFlow for screencasting is available only on the Mac. So um, I do have an alternative for you if you, if you don't, don't have the situation. You should first buy a Mac. <laughs> and then you should use ScreenFlow. Like <laughs> so, I, so I made the screencast. This was like two and a half months of like a bone crushing effort to make the screencast. More than 15 hours of screencast. And it came time to launch them. And here it is. Ruby Inside, Michael Hartle's 15 hours of Rails 3 screencast. So this, this is really exciting. And I, I discovered that it, it, through, through this, that not only do they want to pay you, they really want to pay you. <laughs> so let me tell you about a guy who wrote in. I, I got an email from a guy in Nigeria. I got this Nigerian email. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, I have an email there for you. This is it. Request for urgent business relationship. We were talking about the federal government. No, but seriously, I actually got an email from a guy in Nigeria saying, I'm having trouble buying your screencast. There's some issue with the country code at PayPal. And we exchanged a few emails, and I said, you know, maybe you can pay my credit card. 
And I find this is ridiculous. Like, I want to support this guy in Nigeria. Okay, I emailed him and said, here's a link for a free copy of the PDF screencast bundle. Like, please enjoy it. And he wrote back and said, thank you very much. I'm still going to find a way to pay you. <laughs> and a week later, he wrote back and said, okay, I've, it's taken a lot of time, but I figured out a way to pay you $95, which was the price of the PDF screencast bundle. So it's really, it's shocking that people, they really, really want to pay you. Give them an opportunity, not, not a, a donate link. Give people an opportunity to pay you for a product that gives them some value. So I want to talk a little bit about the implications of this. <laughs> Look at this model again. So we've got an HTML book or an HTML document for free online, and a PDF with, with screencasts for sale. Now, if you look at this, this, this is a freemium model for content. It says you can give away, you can actually give away your entire book and still sell the PDF and then sell screencasts as well. And so I've, there, this, this is applicable to lots of different kinds of content, but I have a specific suggestion for the people in this room. What sucks about open source software? Open source, it's this, this software, this is a new open source uh, library. It's really great, but the documentation, the documentation sucks. <laughs> so I have a suggestion for solving this problem. I want to align the financial interests of people who write good documentation I want to align people's financial interests with writing good documentation. Now you can, you can do this with any project, your own project or another project, but this is the basic idea, which is to put an HTML documentation, to tutorial or structured documentation, on the web for free. And then make a PDF, and possibly some screencasts, and sell them. Now, you, may, you might notice that in my tool chain, there's one thing that you wouldn't necessarily have access to if you wanted to replicate my exact model, which is Polytechnic. And so I want to say Polytechnic will, will I really swear someday, <laughs> probably, definitely, maybe. <laughs> so there, there are a number of reasons I haven't released Polytechnic yet. Um, one of them is that open source software documentation <laughs> sucks, and I don't want to be part of the problem. I want Polytechnic to have good documentation right from the start. But now luckily, I have a tool for writing that document. <laughs> it's called Polytechnic. <laughs> and in fact, I have an idea for how to align my financial interests with this documentation. I'm going to write an article or possibly a book on how to use Polytechnic and make it free online. And then I'm going to make a PDF and a screencast to show you how to use Polytechnic and, and make that for sale. So, so not only will Polytechnic be used to write the documentation for Polytechnic, but it will also be monetized using the business model for which Polytechnic was written. We all know that Ruby is love meta. <laughs> So I, I'd like to quickly acknowledge uh, the, the images I use in an extremely small, unreadable font. <laughs> but these are, these are the images. Um, and I do have a coda, though. I, I want to note that I haven't actually answered the question implicit in the premise of this talk, which is, <laughs> did the Rails tutorial project solve my money problem? Did it solve my money problem? Wait a minute, that's the wrong slide. <laughs> yes! Yes! It's a good problem. I, I agree to the code of victory. Uh, there were successful, really successful launches. The PDF launch and especially the screencast launch went really well. And it's, it continues to sell. I, mean, I have a passive income stream from that. And something I haven't even mentioned, which is actually a pretty cool part of this, uh, it's, the book has, is, has also been published. Um, it's available at an Amazon near you, and here it is. There's, a, there's the print edition. This is part of the uh, Addison Wesley Professional Ruby series. And I just want to, usually you say the full disclosure, this here is an affiliate link. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think you already knew I had a financial interest in the sales of this book. And so if you use this link, then I win coming and going, because I get a commission and a royalty. <laughs> 
The screencasts are also being published by SMLC too, so in Form IT and Safari Books Online, I have those. So I've got this passive income source, and plus whatever the royalties might be. I don't, I don't know what they're going to be, but you know, it'll be something not zero, I hope. And, and maybe the, the coolest thing about publishing your own stuff is that you end up with a customer base. So I've got a bunch of people, you know, many of whom have paid me $95. Um, this is a really qualified list of customers. These are people who, who really are likely to buy follow-on products. So if, if, I'm ever, if I ever find myself in the position I was in at the end of the Y Combinator program where I was worried about paying the rent, four months down the, down the line. Um, I can make another product, and I certainly have ideas for follow-on products. So this, this whole thing couldn't have been done without a whole bunch of awesome people, and, and so I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to thank some of them. Um, on the left, we've got Peter Cooper and Greg Pollock and Matt Aminetti. Um, these guys have just been stalwarts. Matt Aminetti helped me get this thing kicked off. He introduced me to Peter Cooper. Greg has been an incredible supporter. If you go to the end of Rails for Zombies, the Rails 3 tutorial link there is to the Rails tutorial uh, project, which is awesome. Obi Fernandez um, was the series editor on the professional Ruby series and really helped make this sort of, uh, make it, made it possible for me to sell the stuff from my website and also get it published. And he wrote me a great forward as well. Ari Pahaska was the co-author on Railspace, and this would never happen without him. Uh, I'd also like to thank Amy Hoy and Giles Boquette for being inspirations when it comes to selling uh, educational information products online. Um, Derek Sivers, for those of you who don't know him, is incredibly awesome. Go to Sivers.org and read what he has to say. Um, uh, Derek wrote me an unbelievably awesome forward. That you should read that online. It's really amazing. Uh, so Derek is great. And Ron Evans didn't have anything specifically to do with this project, but has been one of my biggest supporters in the Ruby community. So and you'll we'll be seeing him speak next. And finally, Evan Dorn, who we just saw talk about, uh, uh, about NinjaScript, <coughs> has, has been a friend of mine for uh, more than a decade. and. His, uh, his company, Logical Reality, had a hand in a lot of this, including the design and development of the Rails tutorial website uh, itself. I'd also like to thank all the Rails tutorial readers. Um, one of the cool things about publishing online is that you can outsource some of your debugging and copy editing. When you publish one chapter at a time, people write in and say, hey, there's a problem with your, you know, with your controller in this code listing, or there's a typo. And it's really awesome when you can fix the uh, fix the error and deploy the fix, and then write back and say, thanks for the, the report, it's fixed, and then you just reload the, the browser, and it's just, it's awesome. Uh, and finally, this has been great uh, talking to you this morning and uh, having the chance to tell you about this story, so thank you. We've got some time for questions. Yes, Wolf. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Very inspiring. Uh, I'm curious if you understand on uh, insights why people buy the PDF even though the HTML is online for free. Yeah, the, the question is uh, is why do people buy the PDF even though it's uh, available online for free? Um, I think that people really like to be able to, to take that file with them, put it on the computer, and not worry about whether they're going to be online or not. They can put it on that USB drive. They can put it on their their iPad or their Kindle. Uh, by the way, I mentioned iPad and Kindle. I, I I do have a proof of concept for an EPUB version of this. And Polytechnic, I hope eventually will support EPUB and maybe other <laughs> formats as well. But so people people like having that that file that is theirs. Um, but I, I am surprised that as many people bought it uh, as 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 Apple. Other questions? How many copies have you sold of the screencast? So the, the question is how many screen how many copies of the screencast have I sold? Um, I don't know offhand, but. And, and if I, if, I don't want to reveal specific numbers necessarily, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say that, let's see. What's the digital system? Well, yeah, so I, I, I sold it many, many hundreds, let's put it that way. Okay. I, I don't know if it's more or less than a thousand, but it's somewhere in that range. Yeah? Did you consider broadening out into becoming a publisher for other people? Maybe like that for other bodies? Yeah, the question is, have I thought about broadening out and becoming a publisher for other people, like uh, Jeffrey Grosenbach at Peep Code? Um, certainly, Peep Code is an inspiration for this, and in fact, I pitched this idea to uh, to Jeffrey at Gokuruko a couple years ago, and he said, uh, I, want to, I want to make something that like, takes people from zero to Peep Code, so that they could sort of go to his, his material. Um, I think that my thing is is the intersection of education and, and, uh, and technical subjects, and 
I don't see that my thing is having better taste at so, or better recruiting abilities to get authors to or you know, screencasters to come work for me. So Jeffrey's gotten really good at recruiting good people. Um, I think that my competitive advantage is that there are certain things I can do really well. And so what I'm interested in is scaling those things up. Um, you know, I taught physics at Caltech, which was great, but you, that teaching in a classroom setting doesn't scale very well. So the idea behind this whole thing is to make a product that I can capture, or I can capture what I what I do as, as an educator, and then you know, sell it to you know, potentially to a large number of people. Any other questions?